hello everyone and the brother is a chimera mozo and i want to discuss the speech that Omar Gaddafi made on the 23rd of september 2009 at the united nations general assembly uh Gaddafi made a lot of points points that have to do with how the united nations general assembly is not as strong as it should be how the international security council is where all the power lies and no African nation is part of the permanent seat in the International Security Council. So I'm going to read out some portions of this speech and make some analysis and some contributions to this speech. Shall we? Note, the United Nations removed the English transcript of his speech from its website, and Western media removed the transcript of, from all types of media resources. So this one is made available by meta existence organization and it has a lot of things to explain to you now let's go into the transcript of the speech distinguished members of the general assembly of the united nations in the name of the african union i would like to welcome you this gathering will be a historic one in the world and the history of the world and in the name of the general assembly that is presided by libya now in the name of the African Union and in the name of 1,000 traditional African kingdoms in your own name, I would love to seize this opportunity to present congratulations to our son, Obama, because this is the first time that he is attending the General Assembly in this capacity as the President of the United States. And we greet him because it is the hosting country of this gathering. As of the time of this speech, 23rd of September 2009, Omar Gaddafi was the chairperson of the African Union and President Obama was the president of the United States of America and he was sworn in on the 20th of January 2009 and therefore this was um, Obama's first attendance of the United Nations General Assembly as the president of the United States of America. And Gaddafi spoke on behalf of the kingdoms in Africa because before the amalgamations and the different colonizations in Africa, what we had in Africa were African kingdoms and African kings and queens. And Gaddafi reiterated that uh, fact by speaking in the name of 1,000 traditional African kingdoms. And he continued, This meeting comes at the corner of so many challenges that face us. And that the whole world should come together and unite and should put all efforts together. Serious efforts should be put together by the world so that the world will defeat these challenges which constitute the main common enemy to all of us. Changes of climate, challenges of international crisis, or the economic capitalist deterioration and the food crisis. So these are the problems we have in the world. Climate change, the weather becoming hotter in some regions, becoming colder in some regions, international crises, food shortages, in Nigeria, in Somalia, in parts of Africa, in Yemen, where there's conflict. These are the problems we have in the world. And no human being is another enemy. It's an enemy to another human being. But it's when we decide to pursue the wrong cause, when we decide to fight each other, that's when we begin to see each other as our enemies. And we become possessed by hate, by jealousy, by envy, by the quest to dominate each other. And that becomes a problem. But really... The problems we have on earth are not human beings but common threats like food shortages hunger diseases and so on but unfortunately human beings have become the vehicles through which all these things happen and because of that we now fight each other in order to have freedom but that is not ideal now he continued perhaps this one virus may be one of those viruses that was created in the laboratory and it got out of control because it was meant in the beginning to be used as a military weapon, as well as the military. The nuclear proliferation, as well as the hypocrisy, the deterioration, and the control of. So, the year 2009, there was the swine virus issue that affected the whole world. Just like in the year 2019, we also had the coronavirus or the COVID-19. And as of then, there were some speculations that... The swine virus was created in a laboratory in order to use it to destroy the economies of the world. And this same thing happened in the year 2019. And 
Chinese President Xi Jinping was accusing President Donald Trump of creating the COVID-19 in order to destroy the economy of China. And Donald Trump accused President Xi Jinping of creating what he called the Chinese virus in order to destroy the economy of America and the entire world and pave the way for the emergence of the dragon China to become the world power. And the issues has been going on, investigations, United Nations have been investigating or covering up, as some we say, the origin of the coronavirus. So who knows what's going to happen in the year 2029? Probably another virus will be created or will emerge from somewhere and throw the whole world into a pandemonium. So that was also the situation in the world at the time that President Mugadhafi was addressing the United Nations General Assembly. And he continued, Dear brothers, as you know, the United Nations was established and founded by countries who were against the Germans at the time. The United Nations that we have today is different today, but the United Nations is the countries or the nations that will come together against Germany during the Second World War. Yes, the United Nations was formed by allied nations, US, USSR, China, France, and UK. And these nations together were united against Germans who were the leaders of the Axis nations. And in the year 1944, they came together and drafted the Charter of the United Nations. Okay, let's continue. These countries constituted and gave member seats to its own members, talking about the permanent seats. And granted, we are not present at the time. And the United Nations was tailored according to these countries and wanted from us to wear the clothes or the suit that was tailored against Germany. That is the real substance and context of the United Nations that was founded 40 years or 60 years ago. Yes, France, the US, UK, USSR, and China, they founded the United Nations in the year 1945. In the year 1944, they drew the Charter of the United Nations and gave veto powers to themselves. They created the United Nations Security Council and gave themselves permanent memberships and began to ask other nations to join the United Nations. Well, I say those nations were naive enough to join the United Nations. How would you join a United Nations organization that was created by only five persons who gave veto power to themselves, gave permanency to themselves, and they asked you to join, I agree to join. That means you accept that you are not equal to those nations. This happened during the absence of over 165 countries where the ratio was one to eight and one was present and eight were absent. Most nations of the world were not there when they created the United Nations. Those they created, or they made the charter, and you know I have the charter, a copy of it. And one should read the charter of the United Nations. Yeah, I will give the link where you can go to, to see the charter of the United Nations, and you, it's very, very important to read it. The preamble of the United Nations is different from the provisions and the articles, correct? How this came to existence, those who attended in San Francisco in 1945, they all participated in the preamble, but they left articles and the provisions and the procedures. Yes, they left it to the job of the experts and the countries who are interested, which are the countries who created the Security Council, which countries came together and united against Germany. Yeah, there's a very huge disparity between the United Nations Charter and the preamble. And we're also going to look into that subsequently. The preamble is very tempting. He continued, and no one is objecting to the preamble, but everything that came after that is completely in contradiction with the preamble. Yeah, we're going to see that. The preamble of the United Nations Charter is very, very good to promote peace, to end all world conflict and promote world peace, a prosperous world, and so on. That's what is contained in the preamble. This is what we have now. This is what we are injecting, and we should never continue. This came to an end during the Second World War. The preamble says that the nations are equal, whether they are small or big. Are we equal in the permanent seats? No, we are not equal. Yes, Mogadhafi was saying exact correct truth. The, the preamble of the United Nations is completely the opposite of the Charter of the United Nations. The preamble says that the United Nations, the nations are equal, whether they are small or big. But if you go to Article 27 of the United Nations Charter, and also the Article 23, you find out that the United Nations Security Council was created and permanent seats were given to five nations. The US, UK, USSR, 
which is now Russia, China, and France. And these nations have been permanent members of the Security Council since the year 1945 up to the year 2021, and maybe we don't know for how long. Whereas other nations of the world join, and after two years, they leave. So where is the equality? Let's continue. And the preamble says that all nations are equal, whether they are small nations or whether they are big nations, as far as rights. Do we have rights of a veto? Are we equal? The answer is no. If you go to Article 27, verse number 3 of the United Nations Charter, the article says that any resolution that will be passed in the Security Council will have the concurring votes of all the five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council. That is the veto power that they gave to themselves, to France, USSR, Russia, China, the US, and the UK. Other nations of the United Nations Security Council or the General Assembly do not have this privilege, do not have these rights. Therefore, the United Nations is not of equal nations. Therefore, all nations are not equal. Five nations are more equal than the others. Let me put the way it was put in the animal form. All animals are equal, but some are more equal than the other. Simply put, some are greater than the others. All nations are not equal. African nations are not equal to France, USSR, now Russia, UK, US, UK, France, China. Because these nations have permanent seats in the United Nations Security Council and they also have veto power to go with it. And these African nations do not have permanent seats, do not have the right to veto any resolution in the United Nations. Therefore, the United Nations does not make us equal. QED. The preamble says that we are equal in our rights, whether we are big or small. This is what is stated. And this is what we have agreed in the preamble. So the veto is against the charter. Yes. The veto in the United Nations Security Charter, Article 27, verse number 3, and also the charter or Article uh, chapter 23, also these two articles are in direct contradiction to the United Nations preamble. The permanent seats are against the charter. We do not accept it and we do not acknowledge it, neither do we recognize it. Gaddafi ripped up a United Nations Charter at this point. You can see the picture of Gaddafi ripping up the United Nations Security Charter. He had to even fling the paper all over. No other leader, to the best of my knowledge, has been able to say the truth to the United Nations like Muammar Gaddafi, and he had to pay for it with his life. And that is how you know true leaders. A true leader is ready to die for his belief, for his people. But managers will only manage what they have and will never offend anybody because they don't want to lose their business. They don't want to lose their source of income. So I'm asking you a question. Are you a leader or a manager? The question, I think you are the best person to answer. And I myself need to answer the question. The chapter says that we, in the preamble, I mean that we should not resort to the military force unless it is a common interest. This is the preamble which we are happy and we signed and we joined the United Nations because we wanted the Charter to be like that. Yes, that's correct. If wars in the world were to be fought only in the interest of all the United Nations, that means the world would have been a very peaceful world by now. Once you see any detector oppressing the people, the United Nations will come together and rescue the people. Once any nation rises up to oppress another nation, the United Nations would rise up and just feed that nation and bring world peace. But is that actually what is going on in the world? The answer is a big N, very big O, very big no. He says that the armed forces only use it when it is a common interest to all nations. But after that, what happened? 65 wars broke out after the establishment of the United Nations and after the establishment of the Security Council. After this establishment, 65 and the victims are millions more than victims of the second world war are these wars and aggressions and the forces was used and the power in the 65 wars in the common interest of us or very big no over 100 million people died during the second world war according to britannica.com 
and if you check the words that have occurred across the world since 1945 when we when the other nations was formed by these five power world powers you find out that more than 50 million people have died across the world in africa millions have died several wars in africa wars in the middle east wars in asia it's only in europe that we have not had much wars wars in south america apart from in europe where that has been relatively peaceful and north america but across the entire world there's been war and millions of people have been dying despite the fact that we have had the united nations that means there's something fundamentally wrong with the united nations and we have to look into the problem and know how to solve it it was in the interest of one country or three countries or four countries or one country but it was not in the interest of all the nations so the wars that were fought most of these wars that were fought or that been fought are still going on across the world are fought in the interest of nations of the world war as i say is a big business there are nations that produce weapons of warfare and if nobody buys those weapons how would they make profit they fight wars to destabilize their enemies they fight wars to go and collect natural resources like oil gold they fight wars to keep nations retarded so that they will rise only them which is a very demonic way of thinking they fight wars to maintain their power because nations that are at war can never rise so nations of the world sponsor wars in order to keep other nations retarded for life while they themselves will rise and we shall come and discuss about the wars gonna have continued whether these wars broke out in the interest of one country or we are in the whole nations this is in full contradictions and full intervention of the international charter that we signed and unless we do things in the charter of the United nations according to which we agreed otherwise don't we don't speak diplomatically we are not afraid we don't i'm not afraid of being nice to anybody that is how good leaders act a good leader has to say the truth a good leader must have the spirit of truth the spirit of justice you can't see things going wrong and keep quiet and say you are a good leader you're not a leader any person who keeps quiet when things are going wrong is not a leader is a manager at best managers are not their own bosses they have people who they are working for they are like servants or slaves they are working for somebody and they dare not do anything based on their own initiative they must do what the person their august said their master said their slave master said that is what we have across the world most african leaders we have are managers most leaders across the world are managers they see themselves as servants of the colonizers and they dare not speak the truth to power most people priests bishops religious leaders across all religions civil servants and all that what you have mostly in the world are managers and they like calling themselves leaders so then they think leadership is the art of controlling people whoever says that leadership is the art of controlling people is just a person who doesn't know what leadership is all about leadership is not the ability to control people two leaders do not control people two leaders inspire people by displaying acts of courage by casting visions by doing things that inspire and motivate others to take actions by doing that which everybody is afraid of doing leaders are people who do things first before others managers don't do things first managers do what others are doing managers do what they are told to do managers manage things and they do not develop anything they keep things at a particular level and they dare not break away from that level because they don't want to offend anybody but true leaders true leaders shake the table true leaders rock the boats true leaders take initiatives true leaders are three blazers they create new paths they're not afraid of questioning the status quo and they create new paths and every other person follows any person who does this is a leader any person who's afraid of saying the truth is not a leader any person who's afraid of the colonizers of africa is not a leader any person who's afraid of religious leaders afraid of ethnic leaders afraid of his friends and cannot say the truth because of these people is not a leader when jesus christ was on earth he was not afraid of the pharisees the religious leaders of his time he said the truth to them when prophet muhammad was here he said the truth he was not afraid of telling the christ that they should not worship idols that they should worship only allah and that was his belief another person could have a contrary belief but should not be afraid of saying it that is how you know true leaders 
true leaders, philosophers that are true leaders, they say what they know to be truth and they're not afraid of standing by what they say and they do not care what other people think. True prophets that are leaders, they speak the mind of God and they do not care what other people have to say about it. Yes, they're not supposed to be rude. A true leader should not be rude. You're not supposed to be arrogant. You're not supposed to insult people. But you're supposed to say the truth out of love. You say the truth in love and with wisdom. But you're not supposed to mean what you're supposed to say the truth. And that is what Omar Gaddafi exemplified. Omar Gaddafi was a true leader. He said the truth to the United Nations General Assembly. And the United Nations Security Council had him. And they had to take his life. A good shepherd, a good leader, is not afraid of surrendering his life for his people. But unfortunately in Africa, African leaders who are not really leaders, they are not even managers. They are rulers. What they do is they sacrifice the people for their own selves. They take the money that belongs to Africans. They spend everything on themselves as the leaders. And the people who are they supposed to lead are dying every day out of hunger, starvation, colonization. Those people are not leaders. They are only rulers. They are servants and they are slaves. True leaders are liberated from mental slavery and they sacrifice their lives, their comfort for the sake of the people who they lead. And Mogadafi is an example of what I'm talking about and what we know leadership to be about. Here he proceeded. Now we are talking about the future. There is no hypocrisy, no diplomacy because it is a decisive and important matter. Yes, a true leader has to be decisive and has to say the truth straight to the point when it is necessary. The hypocrisy that created the 65 wars after the establishment of the United Nations. The preamble states also that if there is a use of force, then there must be in it the United Nations or the United Nations military interventions according to joint ventures of the United Nations, not one country or two using the force or the military power. The United Nations all of it will decide to go to war to maintain peace and world security. If there's any aggression against any country, the United Nations all together should deter and stop this aggression and should check this aggression. I mean, if a country, any country, Libya for instance, makes any attack or an aggression against France, then the whole United Nations check the Libyan aggression against France because France is a member state. An independent state in the United General Assembly, that is a sovereign country, a member state of the United Nations, and all of us who have to protect the sovereignty of all nations collectively. This is what the preamble states, that all nations should collectively defend, against, defend each nation against external aggression. But unfortunately, that is not what the charter states. If you go to Article 26 of the United Nations Charter, it states, in order to promote the establishment and maintenance of international peace and security, the Security Council shall regulate armaments. <laughs> Let me read it again. Article 26 of the United Nations Charter states that in order to promote the establishment and maintenance of international peace and security, the Security Council shall regulate armaments. Instead of the United Nations General Assembly, we are all the 193 member nations of the United Nations being the arm to regulate wars in the world. They gave it to who? The Security Council. What does it imply? The implication is France, Russia, the US, UK, and China. These five nations are the five nations that decide who will be armed and who will not be armed in the world. They will decide who should fight and who should not fight. If any nation wants to fight or in self-defense or act militarily, it has to get permission from who? From the United Nations Security Council. Instead of all nations in the world collectively voting or deliberating how to defend any nation from aggression, it is only the five nations, the United Nations Security Council, that will decide what will happen. That is, how can five nations regulate armaments? In the whole world, instead of all the 193 nations of the United Nations agreeing, these five nations are they angels without any vested interest? These five nations are you trying to tell me that they don't have any interest in the world? Britain and France colonized 95% of Africa. 
Have they freed those countries completely? Are you telling me that they do, they do not have any vested interest in Africa? Are we not seeing that Britain controls over $1 trillion worth of natural resources in Africa? And that France still holds 14 countries in Africa to host stage? What has United Nations done to end the Boko Haram war, which began since year 2010? Why is the war still lingering? What has the UN done to end colonial structures in the world that are causing wars in Africa and across the world? Why has the United Nations Chapter 26 not helped to do anything as to end the structures in the world that are causing problems in the world? Nations of the world that are having structures that are dominating ethnic groups, dominating one group against the other, have the United Nations charters and, uh, charter and regulations been able to solve these problems? The answer is no. What has the United Nations Security Council or the United Nations General Assembly done to make sure that permanent Security Council, Security Council members do not use the UN to achieve their ends, to use the United Nations as a means to their ends? But that's exactly what has been going on. And Graffi spoke about this. He said, if any country like Libya, for instance, to attack France, for example, the United Nations should come together as a general assembly to stop that. But instead, the Security Council uses the power it has to actually dominate nations of the world. And eventually, Gaddafi turned the victim. On the 6th of February 2011, the Security Council passed a resolution, Resolution 1170, that authorized the seizure of Gaddafi's assets across the world and also recommended that the International Criminal Court should begin to prosecute Gaddafi. 17th of March 2011, the International Security Council passed the resolution 1973 that declared a new flying zone across Libya while France went ahead to start bombarding, bombarding Libya. And eventually, the resolution also talked about the um, sanctions on Gaddafi's allies. Is that what the United Nations General Assembly would have done? Is that what should be should have been done against a nation that did not commit any act of aggression? This is a sovereign nation. Without trying Gaddafi in the international criminal courts, eventually, Gaddafi was summarily executed on the 20th of October 2011 at the Battle of City. Is that what the United Nations is all about? Is that true peace? Since then, Libya has been in a state of war. What about Syria? What about other nations of the world who are facing the same issues and the United Nations has not been able to end this conflict? Instead, it is the battle of one Security Council member, permanent Security Council member against the other because of vested interests. We show that this is not really the United Nations. This is a club of world powers looking for a way to collect the world for themselves. Gaddafi continued. But 65 wars, aggressive wars took place without any actions from the United Nations to stop and check these wars. What did the UN do to stop the Biafran war? The civil war, the Biafran war that took over 3 million lives from 1967 to 1970. What about the Rwanda crisis, 1994? What was done by the, by the United Nations to end the war? What about the killings of Africans by the Arabs in Sudan, which occurred over a period of over 40 years? What did the United Nations do? Before the United Nations intervened, millions of Africans had already died. And eventually, South Sudan seceded from Sudan. But before then, South Sudan had already become one of the poorest countries in the world. And today, South Sudan should be among, if not the poorest country in the world, by, because it has suffered injustice, suffered wars for over a period of 50 years, despite having the United Nations. And he proceeded, these countries, I believe that, believe that they should maintain the sovereignty and independence of the people. These countries actually use aggressive force against people. Yes? We wanted to believe that these countries will make peace and security in the world and protect people. These countries actually resorted to aggressive wars and wars. And as a matter of fact, they enjoyed the veto that was given to them by themselves and enjoyed the member states of the Security Council. But in the meantime, they actually initiated the war which amounted to millions of victims. If we check many wars across the world, find out that they were initiated by the Security Council permanent members. If we check the Biafran war, you found out that, that Britain was complicit. You will check the um, crisis in Rwanda. 
you also find out that this what powers are also complicit france was also complicit in the rwanda genocide you check the wars across the world you find out that the so-called security council permanent members are part of the problems no country has the right to interfere in this affair okay so in the this chapter there is nothing that the United Nations will interfere, which will be the pure business of the internal affairs. I mean the government. There's the internal affairs of a certain government. Yeah, there are affairs that are internal problems that should have been settled. For example, the Libyan affair should have been settled internally. But instead, it became an international affair. Till today, there has not been any cogent reason as to why the United Nations Security Council had to walk nose into the Libyan affair. And if we keep checking what has been going on in Libya, find out that Libya has lost her sovereignty. To who? To all United Nations? No. To only a few permanent members of the United Nations Security Council. Okay, let's continue. No country has the right to interfere in this affair. The sort of government, whether it's a socialist, capitalist system, or whether it's a reactionary, progressive, this is the responsibility of society. It's an internal matter of the people concerned of a certain country. Room no, one day, the senators of Rome, they gave him the amendment to be a dictator because at the time it was good for Rome. No one can say to Rome at that time that you give Caesar this veto. No, the veto is not mentioned in the charter. We joined the United Nations because we thought we were equals. And then there is one country that can object to all of the decisions that we make. And it has a member seat. And who has given this country this member seat? These four countries, they have given themselves member states. The only country that were voted in this General Assembly is China. China were voted to give China a member state in the Security Council. Yes, we joined the United Nations without we were equals. If you read the preamble, you get deceived. But the Article 23 and Article 27, you find out that they have veto power and they have permanent seats in the United Nations Security Council. And the veto, according to Gaddafi, the veto is not mentioned in Charta. Yes, if you go to the Article 27, verse 3, the word veto is not actually mentioned. It was put there shortly. Say that the concurring votes of all permanent members. Except you read it carefully to understand that it's actually the veto power. It looks so simple, it looked like so innocuous, so innocent, as though it didn't mean anything serious. But that was actually the veto in there. And who has given this country this member seat? 1944, they gave it to themselves. They gave it to themselves. These four countries, they have given themselves member states. The only country that voted in this General Assembly is China. Yes. Actually, China joined the United Nations Security Council in the year 1945 with others. But as of then, there was the Republic of China as the government of China as of then. But eventually, the People's Republic of China defeated China and the, that was the Communist Party and began to rule China. And the year 1971, the General Assembly voted to have the People's Republic of China represent China as a country in the General Assembly and the Security Council. And that was the only time that the United Nations General Assembly exercised um, the vote on choosing who would be a member of the permanent seat in the United Nations Security Council. But the United Nations General Assembly also votes to choose those who will be the members of the United Nations Security Council non-permanent members but the non-permanent members of the international security council they are actually second fellows they play second fellows they are not first class members of the permanent security council in fact they are actually there to as rubber stamps of the permanent members of the international security council i proceed this was done democratically but the other member sees was not democratic it was imposed on us this should not be accepted by us it was a dictatorial procedure that was done against our will. Sure. The reform is not increasing of the member states. It's just making things worse. I don't know how this will be translated, but if you add more water, it will be more money. According to Gaddafi, adding more member states to the United Nations Security Council will not be the solution. Africa has been asking for two seats, permanent seats, and five non-permanent seats. According to Gaddafi, if we add more water, it will be more money. That is not the solution. According to him, this is a typical expression to add salt to injury. He wanted to say that if we add more, it will be more problem. If we have more small powers already, the small power that we have already will crash on the peoples of all small peoples. So if we have more small powers joining the United Nations Security Council, let's say if you have Nigeria joining the United Nations Security Council, 
How would that solve the problem for all Africans or South Africa having a permanent seat? How would that solve the problem of all Southern region? They can decide to use that power for themselves. Nigeria can decide to use the power of the Indian Nations Security Council permanent membership to oppress West African nations or to even oppress internal members of Nigeria or ethnic groups in Nigeria who you know, may not want to be members of Nigeria. If you give it to uh, Egypt or give it to Libya or Liberia, these countries might also use it to oppress surrounding nations or to oppress those who are members of their nation. So that is not the solution. I concur with Gaddafi. All of, these, all of these countries were asked to have a seat. That's another problem. Philippines, Japan, Brazil, Nigeria, Argentina, all of them want to have a seat. Currently, Brazil wants a permanent seat. Germany is asking for a permanent seat. India is asking for a permanent seat. Indonesia, the most populous Muslim, Muslim country in the world, is asking for a permanent seat in the United Nations Security Council. That's, that's not the solution. So what's the solution? The solution is for the General Assembly will be a binding that the solution presided for by the General Assembly will be a binding resolution taken by the General Assembly. The solution is that we shall close the admission of the member states. We don't have any more member states. That is an item that is provided for the General Assembly presided by Thatcher now. And in place of that will be the achievement of the democracy based on equality between member states. There should be equality between member states and instrumentation of the powers and the mandate of the Security Council, General Assembly. And for the membership will be for the associations, not for countries. Because if we open the door for more members and more memberships for the countries, it will give the right to any country to have a member seat in the, in the country. And the preamble allow that. No country can for can say for instance you don't have a seat in the Security Council if a seat is given to Germany. Italy will we Germany maybe for the argument of Italy we say it was not Germany. It was not we say it was not Germany, it was an aggressive country. And we in the Second World War. And if you give India a seat, then Pakistan will say we are a nuclear country and we are at war. If you give it to Japan then we should give Indonesia being the biggest Muslim country in the world. And then, Turkey or Kenya will have the same rights. What can we say to them? Argentina, Brazil, Libya. Libya that has scattered the world mass destruction program. Because it will deserve a member state. Because then, it has no service to security by scattering this program. South Africa will do the same. And Tanzania will do the same. So every country has a reason why it should be given a permanent seat in the International Security Council. This door should be, this is false food. And this is a trick. And if we went to the to reform, we want to reform the United Nations, and then we bring more superpowers, more countries, and then we add more to the really big powers, which is why it's a lot of suffering to us. And then the solution is to achieve democracy at the level of the General Congress of the World, which is General Assembly, which is transformation of the Security Council power to the General Assembly. So according to Gaddafi, the solution is what? Transfer the power that currently the, General, the Security Council enjoys to the General Assembly. The General Assembly is the most inclusive arm of the United Nations of United Nations as a whole. There are six organs, six main organs of the United Nations. There is the General Assembly, the Secretariat, the International Court of Justice, the Trusteeship Council, the Security Council, and the Economic and Social Council. Of all of them, the most inclusive that represents all nations equally is the General Assembly. And according to Gaddafi, the solution is to transfer the power of the United Nations Security Council wholesale into the General Assembly. And I made a video talking about that before the uh, before making this video. I talked about this solution also. In that video, I say that the solution that Africa should demand is that Africa should demand that the Security Council should contain all the 103 members of the United Nations. All the 103 member nations of the United Nations should be part and parcel of the Security Council. And all the 55 member states of the African Union, therefore, should be automatic members of the United Nations Security Council. And no nation should have any veto power. And all member nations should be permanent members. That will bring an inclusive and democratic United Nations. And he graphic said, and the Security Council will be just an instrument to implement the decisions taken by the General Assembly to be the parliament of the world and the legislative assembly of the world and this is democracy and the security council should be responsible before the general assembly and we should not accept it
So according to him, the Security Council should be the legislative arm of the General Assembly. I know the Security Council meets more often than the General Assembly. The General Assembly meets from September, for example, Gaddafi addressed this forum September 23rd, 2009. So from September to around January. But the Security Council meets often and on. It meets regularly, which is how every parliament in the world meets. What parliaments meet from time, they meet of weekly, sometimes every day of the week, maybe apart from Saturdays and Sundays or Fridays in Muslim nations, but they meet all the time. Whereas the General Assembly does not meet often and on. So there are two solutions here. Transform the General Assembly into the real power or give a permanent seat to all the International Security Council, uh, all nations, a permanent seat in the Security Council and remove the veto power. To me, that is the best solution. Give the power. All the nations in the world should join the United Nations Security Council so that they can be meeting regularly. Then the United Nations General Assembly, which is the club of world heads of states, should also continue meeting as before. While the Security Council is running the affairs of the world. So this is the solution. So I will be concluding here. The speech continues, but this is where the whole matter of that is the cross of Gaddafi's presentation on the 23rd of September 2009. Now, what I have to say is this what I said before, I'm reiterating that Africa should demand for um, an inclusive United Nations that includes all the member nations of the United Nations in the International Security Council. And to achieve that, the Malabo Protocol, which was signed, which was issued on the 26th of, 26th of June 2014, that needs 28 African nations to ratify. We should ratify that protocol so that we can have a full-fledged African parliament that can be discussing African affairs. And we should pass a resolution through the African parliament demanding a reformation of the United Nations Security Council and United Nations as a whole. And we or should also know that reforming the United Nations is not a walk away, it's not a walkover. Reforming the United Nations Charter requires the vote of two thirds of all the 103 member nations of the United Nations General Assembly. So, all the 103 member states of the United Nations General Assembly, over 90 nations, must vote to support a reformation of the United Nations. And also, all the five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council must vote to support the reformation of the United Nations. And this is how they made it in order to make it difficult to remove that power from them. How can we go about that? Africa must work with the non-aligned movement, the Global South, Germany, Brazil, all these nations that are disgruntled, disenfranchised, that are agitating for a reformation of the United Nations. With all these nations, we can get more than 100 votes in the General Assembly to reform the United Nations. And then all these nations come together and pressurize the five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council to accept a removal of that veto. And that all nations of the world must be part and parcel of the United Nations permanent membership of the United Nations Security Council. And that no nation must have a veto. If they refuse, use all diplomatic measures. Persuade them, use all pressures to make them to accept. If they refuse, boycott the United Nations or threaten to boycott the United Nations. If all the member nations of the non alignment movement, the Global South, which is not yet a movement, it's not yet um, a full-fledged organization, but we need to form in the future to get that by imagining the non alignment movement to the start the global south in order to have the rasa okay russia is should be part of the rasa which i'm going to talk about later so this should be a treaty between a africa s south america a asia and will also include russia but russia is a permanent member yes work all these organizations should come together and pressurize the permanent members to accept a reformation of the United Nations Security Council and keep boycotting the United Nations, keep pressurizing them until they accept. 
and once we reform the United Nations and have an inclusive United Nations, then that's where we have better peace in the world. If after the reformation of the United Nations, we do not have peace in the world, 100%, at least we have more peace and have less injustice in the world than we currently have and less dictatorship and less domination. Because if all nations of the world are equal, then none should have no permanent seat. Why we have some having permanent seat and veto at the same time? So this is what we must do. Pressurize the world. What what were the world um, powers to reform the United Nations? So work with the non-aligned movement, which is the largest organization in the world apart from the United Nations and the Global South and all the nations of the world that are disgruntled to, to reform the United Nations and have an inclusive United Nations. Rest in peace, rest in power, great ancestor, Muhammad Gaddafi, and great Africans, we shall rise again from last to first. God bless Africa.